Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or good afternoon, depending on whether you are in the U.S. or in Europe. I would like to welcome you to the latest webinar in the series, Scientists Empowering Scientists. The episode today is Patch Clamp Equipment for the 21st Century. My name is Jan Dolce. I'm the Product Manager for Patch Clamp Systems at Sutter Instrument, and the webinar today is hosted by LabRoots. The agenda. I will show very few introductory slides. Then Teliga Zatos will talk about configuring a patch clamp rig with Sutter Instrument components. And then our guest speaker, Jonathan Ashmore from the University College London, will tell us something about hearing, or rather tell us what recording from cochlear hair cells can tell us about hearing. And then the third speaker is going to be myself, and I will talk about dynamic clamp with the Detach Patch Clamp Amplifier System, a number of experiments, customized bespoke experiments at the leading edge of technology. And then in the end, we will have a Q&A session, a discussion. The whole thing will take about one hour. Um, for your questions, on the left of your screen, you have the questions box. There's a, a button. Please indicate which speaker your question is directed to. Sometimes that's obvious, but we don't want to have to guess on that. All questions will either be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar, or we will address them offline by email. Also use them for questions for technical issues if you have trouble hearing or something like that. There are documentation materials that were available as downloads, PDFs uh, from the registration page, but most importantly, a video recording of this webinar will be available on labroots.com, but then also on the Sutter Instrument YouTube channel soon thereafter. And also for our customers in China in particular, it will also be on our Yuku channel. And everybody who has registered for that webinar will be notified by email about that. Let me introduce today's speakers. Start with our guest speaker, Jonathan Ashmore. He got his PhD in theoretical physics at the Imperial College London, and then transitioned to what he calls a somewhat painful transition to a wet lab, doing his master's um, in physiology, and then followed that up with a postdoc at UCL. Came to University of California, San Francisco, where he also met and interacted with some of the founders of Sutter Instrument. Then went back to the UK, to the University of Sussex, and then Bristol as a professor eventually. And since 1996 is at the University College London, where he is today Bernard Katz Professor of Biophysics, a fellow of the Royal Society and the director of the London Interdisciplinary Doctoral Program. Then our first speaker will be Telly who graduated in 1987 in computer science and in the same year joined Instratech, the Instratech Corporation, where he went through several roles from support eventually to be the general manager until in 2007, Instratech was acquired by Heka Instruments, where he continued working as a general manager. In that role, that's when he and I met. And since 2015, I have the honor to call Telly my colleague at Sutter Instrument, where he works in product development and technical support. Myself, I graduated in Marburg in Germany, doing electrophysiology and other patch clamp recordings on insects and scylla. And during that time, I already started consulting for Axon Instruments, who hired me in 2003. I stayed on through several mergers until 2011, when I first joined Sutter Instrument, had a short interplay at Hika Electronic, and since 2014, I'm back with Sutter Instrument. I'm the product manager of Patch Clamp Systems today. And with that, let's switch to the first speaker. Teliga Zatos will talk about configuring a patch clamp rig with Sutter Instrument components. Thank you, Jan. So my talk today is be configuring a patch clamp rig with Sutter Instrument components. For over 45 years, Sutter has been constantly designing equipment so that electrophysiologists can push the limits. We have an extensive suite of products that include micropipette fabrication, micromanipulation, imaging, microscopes, noise isolation, perfusion systems, and amplifier systems. We can provide a single source for building a patch clamp rig from the ground up. 
just like the one shown here. Let's review the various components that make up this rig. Electrophysiological recordings are highly susceptible to environmental factors that introduce noise to the signals. Predominant noise sources are mechanical vibration and then electromagnetic interference. SATA offers a series of vibration isolation tables and accessories from TMC Vibration Control that provide the foundation for the rig. Each table provides a steady base with active air suspension for vertical and horizontal isolation. The two inch stainless steel top is available in either metric or imperial hole pattern, floats to maintain a stable level surface for our experimental setup. Our most popular configuration, the AT3036, is a 30 by 36 table and includes a roll-up Faraday cage for EMI noise suppression. Optional accessories include casters for making it easier to move the table, padded armrest, and an air compressor for those labs that don't have house air. Now that we have our foundation, we need to build on it by adding a microscope and its supporting components. I would like to start off with one of the newest specialized microscope, the NAN. The NAN is an extension of the vastly configurable Bob. It was designed for patch clamp and in vivo experiments. It's mounted on a nine inch rail, which provides some height adjustability. It uses Olympus optics. You have a choice of BX2, BX3, or single filter cube epifluorescent illuminator, available with or without a trinocular head. It includes a transmitted light system with a white light LED and with an optional IR LED available in either a 940 or 775 nanometer wavelength. The light system is impervious to spills and can be easily removed for in vivo experiments. Here we have a NAND configured for patch clamp recordings. It includes a BX2 epifluorescent illuminator with trinocular head, an MT78 motorized stage, an MP845 manipulator, white light LED transmitted light system, Lambda 721 as our episource. The focus, stage, and manipulator are controlled by a single ROE200. Let's now review the various components. First, the MPC200 controllers that are not shown. The MPC200 control up to two mechanicals, Two controllers can be daisy chained together as they are for this configuration. A single ROE200 supports up to four mechanicals. The controller is electrically quiet as it was optimized for low noise electrophysiological recordings. Provides ultra low drift and ultra smooth movements. Has a accelerated mode for fast manipulator movement and supports a variety of manipulator mechanicals, motorized translator, and motorized stages. The MPC200 is also multi-link software compatible. Next, we have the MP78 stage. Features include stable support and solid design, 25 millimeter motorized travel in both X and Y. The MPC200 controller provides 40 nanometer resolution steps, Convenient home function allows stage to be quickly repositioned. Four by six milled pocket at the center will accommodate a variety of aluminum stage inserts. We also have custom aluminum inserts available. In this setup, we used an MP845 manipulator, which is one of our newest manipulators. This manipulator is mechanically robust for high stability, uses precision cross roller bearings, has three independent axes with 25 millimeter travel, can carry up to a kilogram, has a tilted swing out gate for easy pipette exchange. This is also one of the reasons we used it on this setup. Also available in the MP800 family is an MP845S, which is a stainless steel version, which is extremely thermally stable, and a narrow format MP865. The MP845 is controlled by the MPC200, but I want to mention the other controller options that are also available, and that is the MPC145. The MPC145 is an ROE with a built-in controller. It can support up to two mechanicals. You cannot daisy chain this controller. Super stable, no holding current. Super quiet as it powers down when there's no movement. 
submicron resolution movements less than 100 nanometers, has a user selectable angle of 0 to 90 degrees for diagonal movement, has four selectable speeds. If you prefer multiple REs in your setup, you can mix and match the controllers to get exactly what you need. Next is a transmitted light source, which is powered by a Lambda TLED. The TLED is a standalone LED light source, has stable output that will last an excess of 50,000 hours, has a high output white light LED. There are several options available, including an IR LED. The LED state can be controlled via an external TTL trigger, as provided by a Sutter Patch software, for example. The TLED Plus also provides an analog input for controlling the intensity. We also have a TLED DC, which is a dual channel TLED Plus that combines two high power LEDs into a single light path. Our NAN uses one of our newest products for the EPI light source, and that is the Lambda 721. The 721 can combine up to seven separate LED cubes with different spectra into a single common output path. Each LED cube contains the LED, optics, and a filter. The LED cubes can be placed in any of the seven positions without any concern for the order. LED cubes are easily exchanged without any tools. Available wavelengths from 340 to 940, and our product manager, Chris Ballard, is always on the hunt for new LEDs. Here's a short video of the Lambda 721 in action and it just illustrates how fast the wavelength switching occurs. Another popular option for epi illumination is the Lambda FLED. The FLED is a high power LED driver for fluorescent microscopy, very stable output, available wavelength similar to the 721, the FLED DC, combines two high power LEDs, typically 480 and 561, but can be ordered in any wavelength combinations, provides ultra high speed wavelength switching. Another microscope option is the Bob. The Bob is a compact, vastly configurable upright microscope platform, ideal for a variety of applications, including slice electrophysiology. As you can see from the illustration, there are many different components that can make up a Bob. The tall optical rail with a single connecting point for quick and easy height adjustments is what makes the Bob unique. For a step-by-step -step listing of all the available options, you can visit the Bob configuration page on our website and go through all the different components. Here is one of our most popular Bob configurations, which includes a BX2 eliminator with a Trinoc head, an MT820 Bob motorized translator, two MT-865 narrow format manipulators mounted on MT-95 stands, an MT-150 W-20 chamber column on an MT-70 stand with a narrow base plate, and Centec USB camera, light LED transmitted light system. The focus translator manipulators are controlled by two daisy-chained MBC-200 controllers with a single ROE-200, which is not shown. Also not shown is a dual epilumination provided by the FLED DC. In this configuration, we used our newest MT95 stands. As you can see, they are different than our classic stands, but provide the same stable support. It's in a smaller footprint. A variety of custom lengths are available. Simple installation using a single quarter 20 or M6 screw, which directly mounts into the table fully adjustable X, Y, and Z axis. The X axis uses our standard dovetail gantry for greater flexibility. The MT-75 was also used in this configuration to hold the chamber column. The MT-75 has adjustable vertical and horizontal axes, up to 360 degrees of rotation, quick lock mechanism for easy positioning, solid construction provides stable mounting, Variety of chamber columns are available, including Petri dish in various sizes, variety of commercially available chambers, and of course, if one of those doesn't work, we could also make a custom one for you. Manipulators. Okay, I showed a few different manipulators, which bring up the question, how do you choose? Well, 
there's no simple answer. We have many, many choices to go through. The perfect combination of controller and mechanical would depend on many factors, including space requirements, the number of manipulators on the setup, the number of ROEs, etc. All I could say is we have a solution for every application. If you plan on using a microscope from either Olympus, Zeiss, Nikon, or Leica, all the components that I just mentioned are available on those as well, including the necessary adapters for the light sources. I'm not going to discuss our micropipette pullers in detail due to the time constraints. Here are just two samples of pipettes that can be made with our pullers. The P1000 uses a filament as a heating source, while the P2000 uses a laser. If you need to pull low noise quartz pipettes, then the P2000 would be your choice. We have many, many videos on our YouTube channel regarding micropipette fabrication. No electrophysiology setup is complete without a perfusion system. It could be as simple as a manually controlled reservoir or a more complex multi-reservoir computer controlled system. SETA offers the popular perfusion systems and bath chambers made by Automate Scientific. Features include reliable solution exchange, it's available one, four, or eight reservoirs, low maintenance pinch valves, the valve link and thermal clamp controllers are compatible with our SETA patch software, the controllers are electrically quiet, and it's available for room temperature operation, inline heated, or with both inline and bath chamber heating. The final piece of the puzzle is our amplifier system. Sutter has a couple of options for those as well. The feature set of the IPA will meet the requirements for the bulk of our customers. The IPA is available in either a single head stage or dual head stage configuration. Typical highlights include whole cell voltage and current clamp experiments, fully integrated patch clamp amplifier with data acquisition system, and includes a SUTA patch data acquisition software. These are some of the applications that the IPA is well suited for, tissue slice recordings, cultured cell experiments, optogenetics, name a few. For those that need additional capabilities, the D-Patch ultra-fast low noise amplifier system is for you. Like the IPA, it's also available in a single or dual head stage configuration. The big difference is that we use here a single controller and each head stage is its own module. And in that module, you have all of the A to D converters, the D to A converters for that particular head stage, plus all the calibration constants. I'm not gonna go through all the highlights. I'm just gonna point out just a couple. Most importantly, the noise, open circuit noise is less than 200 phantoamps and a 10 kilohertz bandwidth, and here with no active cooling. The D-Patch uses an FPGA and ARM core processors, which provides built-in computing power. This computing power allowed us to remove a lot of the analog circuitry with software. It also provides in-field firmware upgrades. Another important highlight is the bandwidth and sampling. Each D-Patch head stage is capable of one megahertz bandwidth at five megahertz sampling rate. So the D-Patch can do everything that the IPA can do, but is very well suited for single channel recordings, recordings from nanopores, dynamic clamp experiments, and any application that requires high bandwidth. If you already have an amplifier available, then the dendrite is your connection to Sutter Patch. The dendrite is a standalone data acquisition interface that shares the same specifications uh, as the IPA in terms of the interface section. Sutter Patch software is what drives all of our amplifier systems and the dendrite. I'm not going to go into all the details of the feature set. You can get a demo version available on our website. We also have tons of walkthrough videos and tutorial videos available on our YouTube channel. Okay, now we have choice of amplifiers. Which one do I choose? Well, typically here, we typically ask three questions. Do you plan to do single channel recordings? Then the low noise option of the D-Patch is probably what you need. Do your experiments require bandwidth that is greater than 20 kilohertz and higher sampling rate greater than 50 kilohertz? Then that would also mean the D-Patch would be a better choice. Finally, 
do your experiments include dynamic clamp? Well, the D patch is the only commercial amplifier out there that has this option. My colleague Jan will talk about the dynamic clamp option in detail in his talk. Finally, some accessories for organization. The GP17 ground point and wiring kit provides reliable, low resistance grounding connections for star grounding configuration inside the Faraday cage. The expansion panels provide easy access to the auxiliary input and output channels, as well as the TTL outputs, and they're available for both the IPA and the D-patch. Sutter produces both polycarbonate and coarse electrode holders, where the quartz holder minimizes thermal expansion and provides the highest pipette stability. To finish everything off, we have equipment racks that are available for mounting the various controllers. So yeah, there's plenty of options available, plenty to go through. What I would recommend is you contact Sutter to discuss your application. We can assist you in configuring your rig today and of course help you in the future if any technical issue arise. Thank you for your attention. And now I'd like to switch over to Jonathan for his presentation. Is that visible now to everybody? Yes, we see that. That's good. So anyway, thank you very much, uh, Jan and Telly, for the introduction. I'm going to tell you a little bit about cochlear hair cells. This is a crash course in hearing, followed by my brief exposure to the D-patch patch amplifier, which Telly has just been telling you about, to tell you what you can actually do on a isolated cells from the cochlea. So first of all, a crash course on hearing. When you hear something, you're listening to a range of frequencies, which it can extend from a few tens of hertz up to 20 kilohertz if you have really good hearing, that's when you're young. Um, and by comparison, this is what a piano keyboard looks like. A piano, the highest note on a piano extends up to about four kilohertz. But as you get older, you begin to lose the high frequency part of your hearing range. And so this is a spectrogram of when I say cochlea, you begin to lose the high frequency components, which make us able to distinguish one bit of speech from the next. So people tend to make mistakes as their hearing falls off. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this, of course, is that our favorite animal, the mouse, which, on which you can do genetics, has a hearing range which only starts at about one kilohertz. But the surprising thing is, of course, is a mouse hearing, and in fact, many rodents hearing, goes up way beyond, beyond 60 kilohertz, possibly up to 80 kilohertz and more. And that means that this range of hearing, as such, is on a frequency range which is beyond what most electrophysiological systems up to now are capable of, of recording. I'll come back to that in a moment. The way, of course, in which our mammalian hearing works is, is that the sound is separated by a structure called the basilar membrane inside your inner ear. And that is then signals off along the auditory nerve to the brain. And there's about 30,000 or so auditory nerve fibers in us and about 10,000 in a mouse. And the cells which actually detect the movement of the basilar membrane are called the inner hair cells. They have a most interesting ribbon synapse down the bottom. But at the top, they have these little processes called hairs. You can also see on with a light microscope, which are the, where the, the sensory organelle of the hair cell. There's another class of cell called the outer hair cell, and they turn out to be motor cells, actuators which amplify the sound once it enters the ear. So let's start off with a little bit of, as it were, electrophysiology. This is the equivalent circuit of a cell. They sit in an epithelium, so the current enters from essentially the apical end. It goes through the ion channels, the conductance indicated like so, and then passes through the cell and passes out through mainly potassium channels at the base of the cell. And a substantial fraction of that current actually passes out through the membrane uh, capacitance, the lipid here. And so the combination of the capacitance and the resistance of the cell produces a low pass filter, which means that very fast signals produced by deflection of the hair bundle backwards and forwards will actually get filtered out. Now, there's been a huge amount of interest recently in what that actual iron channel at the top of the hair cell is. This is the best guess so far. It's turned out to be very difficult to find because it turns out to be a complex, not a simple channel. And the idea is that as the bundle moves backwards and forwards, a little filament pulls on this channel and mechanically gates it open. But there are all sorts of other accessory proteins, as well as TMC1, what the channel itself. And it's the identification of the way in which that complex works has been very difficult. But the identity of TMC1 has really only been established more or less convincingly over the past few years or so. 
But there's also a huge amount of extra work, both in electrophysiological physiology and uh, cell biology from a number of labs, such as Robert Fetty Places, and Tony Ritchie's, Jeff Holtz, Walter Mocotti, Anthony Peng, and many, many others. So it's a hot area where you should watch this space. Things are going to happen there. But I'm going to tell you now about outer hair cells. Outer hair cells, I said, are the motor cells. And most of the experiments I'm going to be talking about are actually done on an inverted microscope. Uh, which gives you access to isolated cells once you've extracted them out from the cochlea. And mammalian outer hair cells are sort of peculiar because not only do they change lengths, but they generate force when the membrane potential changes. So here is a cell, an outer hair cell from a guinea pig. They can easily be recognized because they have these hairs, stereocilia, and they have also a, a new, displaced nucleus. And here's the patch pipette down the bottom. So when the inside goes positive of the cell, the cell gets a bit shorter. And when it goes negative, it gets a little bit longer, by about 4% or so. And the mechanism which is responsible for that is a protein which is embedded down the sides of the outer hair cell membrane, just the outer hair cell, not the inner hair cells. And that's called um, a protein which is called prestin and was identified um, by Peter Dalosh's lab in Chicago in the year 2000. But as far as the EM is concerned, it looks like a, a membrane particle about eight nanometers in diameter or so. And so it's probably a tetramer of this molecule pressing, which can be found um, from a genetic screen. However, it turns out that pressing is actually a membrane ion transporter. It's a member of the superfamily of solute carrier superfamily number 26. And that produces problems in its own right. It's not actually an ion channel. Now, the way in which, one of the ways in which it was identified is because when the cell undergoes a movement, there's actually an associated gating charge. And this gating charge can be seen if you step the membrane potential very quickly, both for the whole cells, but also for individual little patches of membrane down the side of the membrane. And if you follow the, this patch of membrane using essentially a laser light with a position detector, you can see that the patch actually moves in and out as the membrane potential changes. And the charge associated with that gating current um, can be essentially follows or even possibly precedes the patch movement itself. Now, the time constant of this is quite short in the order of about um, somewhere around between 10 and 15 microseconds. So we're already into high uh, frequency electronics, as it were. And what we would really like to know is what's the limiting time constant of that gating charge movement. So that was the, as it were, the electrical fingerprint which enabled Preston to be identified. Now, the way in which charge is to be measured most readily in a cell is because if you imagine a capacitance in a cell, it, as you add charge or take charge away from it, essentially that's a linear process. So by measuring the amount of charge that you can transfer as a function of membrane potential, you can actually work out what the membrane capacitance is. It turns out for an outer hair cell, that is not a linear line, it's actually a nonlinear line. And the derivative of the charge transfer as a function of membrane potential is actually a capacitance, and that's been called a nonlinear capacitance. And the capacitance can be most readily measured in a cell using some sort of lock in amplifier method, as a way that was originally described by Marty and Neyer in 1983 when all the patch clamp technology was first introduced. And that's where, of course, the D patch comes in and extremely useful. It's got a very nice lock-in um, amplifier facility to, to show you. So now what I'm going to show you is some one very preliminary of a few measurements that were made from a, a rat outer hair cell. Um, it's a rat, not a guinea pig, because you can't get guinea pigs for love or money post-Brexit in this country. And here is an isolated outer hair cell from a P18 rat, and it's been patched on the base. And when the membrane potentials are stepped for a variety of different potentials, you can see that there's an outward current that is developed. And here is the current voltage curve that you then measure. But the strange thing is there's a little blip right at the beginning and also at the end, which you can't null by cancelling out the membrane um, transients. And that, in fact, is this gating current. So if we look at it on a slightly higher time scale, you can see here is this deviation from the linear behavior. So here I would be plotting the current as a function of membrane potential as I step through the different steps for that, that 
particular cell. And you can see it's a kind of non-linear curve with a kind of half point somewhere around about 10, minus 10 millivolts in this particular cell. Now, the nice thing about the deep patch is that you can immediately switch to a lock-in routine. And when you do that, it implements the um, lindau nea algorithm. It gives you a very nice bell-shaped curve, which is essentially the derivative of this particular curve here. And you get two things for the price of one. Not only do you get the, the capacitance in absolute terms, so this actually measured the capacitance of the cell, but you also get the IV curve, and hence the conductance of the cell at any particular potential. And the readout for that set of data took about 15 seconds. So it's, it's a very efficient way of doing it. These capacitance changes are quite small, but the resolution of this particular algorithm in the D-patch is even better than that. And you can probably measure the femtofarads necessary for uh, cell expression uh, experiments. So that was an interesting experience with the D-patch, and it was very impressive. There's an interesting bump here, which I don't quite know what that's to do. But again, that's something which can be explored. Now, where should we go from here? Well, one of the interesting things, of course, is that if you then measure the capacitance not at 500 hertz, which is what the, uh, the, the D patch was measuring the, this capacitance at, but a variety of different measuring frequencies, what does the capacitance do? Well, it turns out that it falls off. And in some experiments that Jonathan Gale and I did a long time ago, it looks as though that nonlinear capacitance maximum begins to have a kind of corner frequency somewhere around about 10 kilohertz. So the question is, is that the limiting ability of the Preston to change conformation? And of course, it's not completely satisfactory because in those days, a long time ago, we were using electronics which had limited bandwidth. And so it's a very exciting prospect to see whether we can actually do better using the wide band of the D-patch. Now, just very briefly, finally, how does a transporter work as a molecular motor? Well, it turns out that a transporter has a cytoplasmic vestibule, which as the anion moves in and out of it, it undergoes a conformational change in the plane of the membrane. And so you could imagine that if this ion moves in and out fast enough, you could actually get changes in the area of the protein. And then because there's so much protein crowded into the lateral membrane, it gives rise to cell length changes and therefore a force generation which will modify the mechanics of the cochlear itself. It definitely requires intracellular chloride. Um, the only known blocker is salicylate, which is, there's been psychophysical data about that for ages, which is aspirin interferes with your hearing because aspirin is the methylated version of salicylate. And the transport itself is a pretty low efficiency chloride transporter, but there's so much of it that it probably is capable of regulating the chloride inside the cell. So then how does this all fit together? So the idea is here is the essentially the equivalent circuit of the, of the hair cell, outer hair cell, inner hair cell. Here is the current flowing through the transducer and out through the conductance at the base. And you can imagine that if the membrane somehow is stretched or pulled, that little ion may be forced in and out of that vestibule. And it's rather like a sort of piezoelectric current, rather like a sort of gas lighter that you would use to light your stove. And the idea is that that's been gradually emerging, particularly from the work of Kuni Iwasa and more recently from Rick Rabbit, is that that current becomes essentially what looks like a piezoelectric current, which can flow in the opposite direction to the membrane capacitance current, and therefore nullify it and ineffectively reduce the effective capacitance of the cell. So the time constant will become very, very small. And so what this means in circuit terms is that instead of there being current going in through the transducer, there's another source of current, which is actually going through the lateral membrane. So what are these biophysical problems that require new generations of recording systems? First of all, we'd really like to know whether iron channel kinetics actually determine the upper limit of hearing. And you need for that wide bandwidth and low noise recordings. Why should animals only be hearing up to 100 kilohertz? Is that the limiting uh, opening rate of the iron channels that you find at the tips of the stereocilia? And also, are there limits to the mechanics of sound detection itself? How does hearing work above 20 kilohertz? What does the outer hair cell actuator do at these very, very high frequencies? Is that hypothesis actually correct? And it comes back to this little problem again, which is that, well, what's the mouse actually doing with its hair cells once it, you get beyond the conventional range that uh, electrophysiology can look at, in other words, the sort of the 10 kilohertz or so? And that maybe is the kind of direction in which we should be thinking about going for in the future. 
So finally, just thanks to Sutter Instruments um, for the, the loan of this D patch, to Jan and Adam, who were helping all of us on the faculty and students on the biology of the INAO workshop at the MBL um, Marine Biology Labs in Woods Hole in, uh, a couple of years ago. And that was a great introduction to this particular machine. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was a very exciting talk, but I'm excited to hear about the results that the D-Patch generated during that demo loan this summer and that you were able to make uh, to generate meaningful recordings with that and that the high bandwidth, which is one of the features of the D-Patch, actually showed useful and that it opens um, the exploration of a field that is unexplored. So let me see whether I can share my own screen now. Okay, the final talk of the day. The title of my talk is Dynamic Clamp with the D-Patch Patch Clamp Amplifier System. I'm going to talk about bespoke experiments, customized experiments at the edge of technology. As I said, my name is Jan Dolzo. I'm the product manager for the Patch Clamp Systems at Sutter Instrument. I'm going to give you a brief introduction about what Dynamic Clamp is. It's not something that uh, was newly invented, but the D-Patch has the ability to take it to the next level. I'm going to talk about how Dynamic Clamp is implemented in the D-Patch system in particular. And then I will show you two scenarios in a live demo. One is eliciting action potentials by injecting current steps into a model cell. And then the visualization of the dynamic clamp current that in essence helps you monitor the experiments and making sure that what you think you apply to the cell is actually what uh, you apply to the cell. And then I'll summarize and again uh, explain what the advantages of the D-Patch system are compared to other systems that provide dynamic clamp. What is dynamic clamp? It's also known as conductance clamp. And it was first introduced in 1993 by two separate groups, Eve Marder at uh, Brandeis and Robinson and Kawai in Cambridge, UK and in Japan. And since then, there have been quite a number, a large number of uh, publications with dynamic clamp. Here is one example from Astrid Prince et al. Um, showing an aplysia neuron, action potentials from an aplysia neuron during a spike train. The initially relatively short action potential gets longer in the control conditions. And then this effect can be blocked pharmacologically by blocking two types of potassium channels, IA and the delayed rectifier potassium channel. And this pharmacological block can then be rescued by injecting the currents that these two channel types conduct using dynamic clamp and then this initially short and then uh, get getting longer uh, action potential this behavior uh, also occurs so in this case you can mimic currents and that lets you explore what these currents would have looked like to begin with either with a pharmacological block or of course the same would be if you use a knockout mouse knockout uh, model Another example of how dynamic clamp can be used is by doing the opposite thing, by not injecting the currents as activated currents, but by using a negative conductance and mimicking the pharmacological block by subtracting negative currents. And again, this effect of the action potential getting longer in the course of a spike train is blocked, disappears as if it was pharmacologically blocked. A uh, third scenario that I'm not going to talk about today would be mimicking synaptic input to a cell in a slice in a tissue sample. So let's look at the uh, verbal definition of dynamic clamp. If we do voltage clamp, we inject and then also measure the current that's required to maintain a given membrane voltage. In current clamping contrast, we inject a fixed amount of current and in dynamic clamp, we inject a current that is a function of the measured voltage, not a fixed amount, unlike regular current clamp. The injected current, in essence, is a conductance 
that is a function of the voltage, the membrane potential here, and we have to take the reversal potential into account, and if we set that to zero, then in essence that will be a leak conductance, a leak channel. But in reality, it's a little more complicated. We have the sum of all conductances as a function of the membrane voltage minus their respective reversal potentials. And this is the same equation. And if we look at the one of the conductances that we typically have in a cell, a sodium conductance, that would be governed by an activation gate. In the case of a voltage-gated sodium channel that has uh, three particles, and an inactivation gate H that is only one particle. That leads to a series of uh, differential equations here. I'm not going to go into the math. All I want to highlight here is the dm by dt, looking at the um, activation gate, it's a function of time, and that time, that dt, the time intervals, need to be both short and constant. That's important, no wobble. And that's the challenge doing that with conventional electrophysiology systems is not that easy. Why is that? Because a conventional patch clamp system consists of an amplifier that puts out an analog signal that gets fed into a computer interface. And the computer interface is controlled by software. The software also puts out stimuli to the amplifier. But what's important is this connection is typically USB, and the computer typically runs on either Windows or a Mac machine. And those are operating systems that are not real-time operating systems. That means if you want to do dynamic clamp, you need those constant real-time intervals, that means you need to split up this computer into two computers, one that's responsible for data collection and the other one that controls the dynamic clamp and runs a real-time operating system so that you have the fast and consistent timing that you need to compute the current that you want to inject back. As I said, Windows or Mac uh, are not real-time operating systems, so they can't be used. And you can't use in a USB connection because all that introduces delays that are not only not under our control, they're also not constant. Hit the stage, the, the D-Patch Ultrafast Low Noise Amplifier System. And this is, in essence, something that looks like this. We have the head stage, then we have an interface, and then we have um, FPGA, a field programmer with gate array, um, and also two ARM core processors in the system. They give you a lot of computing power, and they take the place of the dynamic clamp computer, the second computer that I had on the previous slide. So if we look at that here, on the D-Patch system, we have a head stage. We have an interface that's in the blue box, the preamplifier here. FPGA and ARM core are in the main unit, and the software runs on the computer. And that's exactly what I have. Oh, um, before I forget, uh, depending on the conductance model, this can run at update speeds up to 500 kilohertz. And that's not the sampling rate. The sampling rate is 5 megahertz, 10 times as fast. But the dynamic clamp current can be updated at that speed of up to 500 kilohertz. And what I have sitting on my desk here is uh, exactly that. I have my D-Patch main unit, then I have the auxiliary output one connected to the auxiliary input one, and why that's important, we'll get to that in a minute. I have the preamplifier unit here, and I have the head stage with a model cell in cell setting, and I don't even need a whole lot of shielding. You're gonna see when I switch to the software demo, uh, there's not a whole lot of noise going on there anyway. The whole thing is controlled by SATA patch software. I'm not going to go into any details of the basic operation. As Telly already mentioned, we have a number of videos on our YouTube channel about that. I'll just briefly talk about dynamic lamp models, and we will use the Hodgkin-Huxley style gate model in the demos that I'll show. We also have a Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz conductance model uh, and a Markov model. And then we have what's called variable conductance model. And again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into that today. One thing we are considering the variable conductance model could be folded into the Hodgkin-Huxley style, in essence, with a constitutively open conductance. Uh, you can mimic that as well. So that may change in the user interface. Um, I'm also not going to go into too much detail about the user interface of the dynamic clamp. That is explained in a webinar that we held last year where Greg Helmstedt introduced a lot. And uh, I also 
listed a number of slides from his presentation where he introduced um, quite a few aspects of the dynamic lamp and also explained the basic operation of the user interface in that area that's available on our YouTube channel. The first scenario that I'm going to show you is elicited action potential, and I'm going to show that in both membrane test and then we'll create an FI plot. In the membrane test, here's the membrane test window. We have our voltage signal, our current step, and here is the D-patch control panel. And that looks a little complicated at first sight, but we really only need to focus on two components. One is up here, we are in current clamp mode, and that little flag shows that a dynamic clamp is loaded. And the second one is here, the holding current. I'm injecting minus 250 picoamps. That is because my model cell is a passive model cell, just a passive ohmic and uh, with a capacitance a model cell that doesn't have uh, resting potential. So I'm mimicking, in essence, the resting potential. If you do something like this to a real cell, that cell might not be all that happy because keep in mind, if you inject a steady current, you're moving charges. That means you're changing the ionic composition in the vicinity of the cell. You're either depleting or enriching ions potentially. So you probably don't want to do that with a real cell. And then what I'll do is with the Hodgkin-Huxley model loaded here, I will not use a constant holding conductance, but I will use what's called a conductance stream where I can, in essence, change the, the holding conductance um, during my experiment using the deep patch control panel. And I'll explain that a little bit in the live demo. And then the second thing I'll do is uh, I'll create an FI frequency over current plot where I inject current steps of increasing amplitude and then look at the action potentials that elicits and I'll measure the frequency and plot that in real time. The second scenario I'm going to show is synthesized voltage gated sodium currents, I'll first create an IV plot, then I'll show steady state inactivation and recovery from inactivation. And in the interest of time, I'm probably going to gallop through the latter two relatively quickly. So here, looking at that, that will be the IV plot. Here will be the steady state inactivation. And here will be the recovery from inactivation from a lengthy conditioning pulse here. The longer the interval is to my test pulse, the more sodium currents uh, recover. Let me switch to software. Soda pitch runs on Igor. Two components that we're going to work with, the dynamic lamp editor and the, the routine editor. And over here is the deep pitch control panel. And first, as I said, I will run the membrane test. And I need to load. I'm going to load my Hodgkin-Huxley model here. This is, in essence, uh, run continuously. I have three conductances, a sodium, a potassium, and a leak current. Sodium has an activation and inactivation gate, as I explained before. And if I load this, the little flag here shows it's there, and then have a, a, a constant train of action potentials here. That is because my holding current hasn't been enabled yet, so let me enable that. And then we only get action potentials during the duty cycle of this 100 picoamp step, over here is the uh, the amplitude, um, only during the duty cycle I'm, I'm, I get action potentials here. And then I can play with the holding conductance. This is 1.2 micro Siemens starts. And I can use the triple slider here. That's a control that we have in several instances in the deep pitch control panel where I have three sliders with different sensitivity and I can reduce the conductance to the point where, oh, sorry, what I should actually do is make the change here. The holding conductance was fixed at 1.2 micro Siemens. I need to use the conductance stream in order to control that over here. So let me load, let me update the model conductance model has been updated, and now I should be able to reduce the holding conductance to the point where I only get a single action potential at around one micro Siemens. And if I reduce it further, somewhere around 830, 850, I start seeing action potentials. And if I go high enough with the holding conductance, then eventually I'll get action potentials throughout the entire sweep of the membrane test. So that is just one example. This is my completely 
passive model cell here that with dynamic clamp fires action potentials. The second thing I was going to show you was running an FI plot. So here are my current steps of increasing amplitude. I'm recording the current and the voltage signal. Here is my stimulus out. And then in real time, I'm plotting the frequency versus the segment amplitude here. And if I run this, it looks like this. Up here are my current steps. And down here are the action potentials. And here the frequency is plotted in real time, starting at about minus 200 picoamps. I get a relatively high uh, frequency. And let me switch to the second scenario here. I have the derivative of the Hodgkin-Huxley conductance in essence. Let me duplicate that and call that dynamic clamp NAV. And what I want to do here, derive in essence from the original um, Hodgkin-Huxley model, I'm only interested in the sodium conductance. I'm not interested in the potassium or the leak conductance. And then I'm going to use a different routine. This is a derivative of the sample routine IV. The main, let me highlight the main changes here for the input channels rather than using current and voltage. I'm using the auxiliary in. You remember I'm feeding my auxiliary out signal back into auxiliary in. I also need to derive my voltage signal from auxiliary out three. And then I also have a virtual signal where I have the stimulus, that's the representative of my stimulus signal here, then for the output signal, that is my voltage steps here, and for the measurements, I'm measuring the peak current, the absolute peak um, during the step, and I'm plotting that versus the command. And that gives us, oh, of course, I also need to load this, I still have the Hodgkin-Huxley model loaded. And that, of course, does not give us a good sodium IV curve. So let me load the sodium IV and run this. And then what we're getting is sodium inward currents here. And again, this is my model cell, my, my totally passive model cell sitting on my desk generating what looks like sodium currents that are governed by the conductance model, the Hodgkin-Huxley model that I have loaded. This can also be used for assay development. And let me just show real quick the other two, back to the routine editor, uh, the voltage-dependent inactivation. So what we see here is at the end of a, an inactivating, a conditioning step, we see the current activating more and more, but we also see it's bottoming out here at the beginning. That is because my holding conductance is too large. So let me put that 0.5 micro and run that again. And now it doesn't bottom out anymore. And we get the same, get the same thing. And very briefly, let me run the recovery from inactivation executing this. So what we have here is our inactivating step. And then at the end of the step, the intervals between the step and our test pulse increase. And here again, I show in real time the recovery. And let me briefly summarize the advantages of the D-Patch system. We have a powerful dynamic clamp engine with update rates, as I mentioned, of up to 500 kilohertz. You do not require any third-party hardware for that. That is a um, big advantage over other systems available. We have multiple conductance models that are supported. The synthesized current can be monitored, as I just showed you, and that can also be used for assay development. And we have dynamic lamp pools. I didn't go into that too much. Um, that, that was, in essence, the, the conductances that I selected from. The data acquisition management and analysis software is integrated and included with the D-Patch. The conductance settings are saved with the experimental data. Metadata are stored. Again, this is something that's in, in other presentations that we've done in the past. And there's powerful analysis tools available. And with that, let's switch to the question and answer session. Now, switch over to Telly for that. 
Thank you, Jan. Okay, we do have a couple of questions here. I'm going to first take a few questions that were addressed to me. So I'll handle those first, and then I'll ask the questions that were for Jan and Jonathan. So one question came in, can you link two IPA together to create a virtual double channel amplifier? Yes, you can. In Sutter Patch, we support multiple IPA. So it's not just two single IPAs, but you can mix and match a double and a single IPA or two double IPAs to get you basically double the channels that you need. Another question, does Sutter offer an installation service to help build the setup at the customer site? Yes, we do. Um, and that is something that we discuss with the customers when we are configuring the setup, and that's an option for them. Final question for me, can magnets be used on a stage platform to guide or secure cables? Well, you can't attach magnets to the stage platform itself, but on the 4x6 insert, that is available in stainless steel, and you could use magnets and, and tool holders on that 4x6 riser. Okay, so now let me go in and ask a few questions. First, let's start off with Jan. Can I program my own function for a conductance? Yes, you can. That is something I didn't show. You would um, put that in, let me switch back, in the dynamic clamp editor. In essence, what you would do, you would create a channel that you call my channel, and then uh, for an alpha and beta, in essence, for, for, for one of those constants, what you can do is you just call your Igor function, and that Igor function will execute whenever you run this model. You can also define that as a tau and infinity, and you would make that constitutively open, in essence, a first order and the initial state is on in this case. And that way you can do that. You can also combine multiple conductances. And you can use with the conductance stream, you can even use an arbitrary waveform to run that. Okay, since you are still in present mode, let me ask then a couple of other questions. Um, can I use a complex waveform, such as a current recording for dynamic clamp? Yes, that's exactly what I just mentioned. You would use a conductance stream, and you can use, let me switch to the routine editor, in essence, in your waveform, edit the waveform, rather than, for example, a value and an increment, you would use a template here. And that template could be something here like a, uh, let's look at the template duration, that, that could be a, uh, a train, I'm zooming in here, sorry. There will be a train of action potentials that's used as a template here. This is from uh, from one customer, but I would have to define that for the conductance stream. Sorry, that was my mistake. So here, this this is uh, this is where you, where you would do that. And then here, this sequence of action potentials will be used as the conductance stream. And again, you can combine up to two conductance streams. So you have a lot of flexibility here. And I'm looking forward to the experiments, some of them in progress, actually, where this is being put to good use. Thank you. Jonathan, here's a question for you. Have we identified all the ion channels present in the cochlea? Well, I guess up to a point, but obviously the, the, what makes any system interesting is the different variants of ion channels that you actually find. So by and large, in hair cells, most of the ion channels are probably potassium channels of various sorts. So the rapid answer is yes, but it goes one step further than that. I mean, we're actually interested in the confirmation of these channels where they are in the cochlea, and also the essentially if you have a complex type of ion channel interacting with many other proteins, such as you find in the transduction step itself, then I think we're in. We've identified them, but we don't know how they actually all assemble together. It's a structural problem at that at this stage. Thank you. Here, one more for you. What are the bandwidths of interest for the auditory system? Yeah, that's a thorny one. I think, I mean, I think it's really interesting. I mean, this question that's been around ever since single ion channels were first identified, which is that what's the opening rate of an ion channel? And there are theoretical ideas as to what that might be. Nobody's actually sort of measured them. Um, they've made good estimates in the sub-microsecond range. But as I mentioned, one of the curious features is that you don't actually find animals listening at frequencies of one megahertz. Perhaps they don't even need it biologically. But even more importantly, is it that the transduction step itself 
limits the bandwidth of hearing. In other words, frequencies up to, but not all that much more than about 100 kilohertz or so. Thank you. Jan, here's one for you. Is this system suitable for simultaneous patch clamp and calcium transient recordings in the single neuron of the brain and spinal cord slide? I would think yes, if calcium transient recording, if you mean like FURA measurements, Horatio metric measurements, uh, we should be able to get that in. But that is really something that we would ask you to directly get in touch with us so we can discuss your specific requirements. Um, or actually, we should have your email and can directly get back to you about this question and discuss that in more detail. Ah, uh, here's a few more. Is it possible to measure gap junction conductances between two different neuronal cells? Um, I assume that's also for me then. Uh, that should be possible. With the D-Patch 2 with the dual head stage version, you should be able, if you can patch the two cells simultaneously, you should be able to measure that. That should be as simple as a resistance recording. Yeah, I don't see why that would not be possible. Is it possible to do the fast scan voltometry experiment to measure the release of dopamine from neuronal cells? That is possible at this point within a limited voltage output range. We are working on a voltammetry head stage, though, that can be used for the D-patch. The D-patch supports the use of different types of head stages, so it would automatically recognize that it's a different head stage and have the internal scaling and everything uh, adapted. Let's get back to you once this is ready, or depending on the uh, output voltage that you need, it might be possible today. But for most voltammetry, I think you need to be more positive than, than one volt, and uh, at this point, we can't do that. Can I just make a comment here? I think that this is a very attractive feature of any software programmable head stage that you can actually do this sort of kind of switching and it requires minimal changes of the hardware because most of the hard work is actually being done by the software. That is correct, yes. You will need different hardware in, in this case because the output range is limited by hardware and also voltammetry head stage needs less complex um, circuitry, so it might even be able to offer that at a lower price than a regular head stage. Okay, here's a question that I will tackle. We are planning to buy an amplifier to do these experiments mentioned above. May I use ClampFit software to analyze data? I do not know how to use Igor Pro. Well, yes, we do have an export option in Sutter Patch that will allow you to go to either ABF, I think, believe it's a 1.8 format, also ATF, but you do not need to know how to use Igor to use Sutter Patch. We've built an entire application that uses Igor as our engine, and there may be already the tools built into Sutter Patch that may handle a lot of the analysis for you. If you send me or Jan an email uh, with the exact analysis requirements, we could advise better. Can I just add that this was my problem as well? And so I did find myself using the export function quite a lot to, to, to look at the data subsequently. But I think it's just a question of getting onto the learning curve for Igor. That is a very valid point. Um, thanks for making that, Jonathan. It's a relatively small learning curve, actually, for a lot of people. Um, it's a fairly common question, can I export the data to analyze it in something that I'm more comfortable with, whether that's MATLAB, whether that's ClampFit or PClamp. But particularly PClamp users find their way around Sutter Patch usually very quickly. And in fact, we have people who completely converted from PClamp to using Sutter Patch throughout their lab. Okay, there's a few questions here, but I think we've already passed our limit, so I think we will try to answer those offline by email. I'd like to thank everybody for attending this webinar. Jan, any last remarks? Other than, yes, thank you very much to everybody from me as well. And um, as Telly said, all questions that have not been addressed here in the Q&A session will get back to you by email. And have a great rest of your day or have a great evening.